See, what God is trying to do is he's trying to get heaven into you. And you can live in this fallen world and still experience and live out of heaven. But the only way that we're able to do that is by becoming more like him, thinking the way he thinks and, and trusting in him and, and allowing him to change us so that we're not engaged in the actions that are causing hell. <laughs> Instead, we're engaging in the choices that are bringing heaven. Oh, can I get a better amen than that? Yeah, it's true. And so let's jump into the final fruit of the Spirit, amen. Galatians 5, and 23, it says the fruit of the Spirit is love. And that is the fruit. Of course, it gets manifested in all these other ways. And of course, it gets manifested in joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness. And we're going to finish today talking about gentleness and self-control because against such things there is no law, amen. Now, when I looked up the word gentleness, I was actually blown away because it wasn't what I thought it was going to be, amen? And normally when you think of gentleness, you just think of somebody that's like really gentle. But really the word gentleness in the original language, in the Greek, it actually means gentle force. And so gentleness isn't just that I am like a very gentle person. Now, it, 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 it has nothing to do with that. It, it actually, it, it, it's talking about a force that's taking place and a force that is bringing about change, but it's not bringing about change in a way where you're mandating it or, or, or you're violating someone's free will in order to establish it. Now, I think that's very interesting because during the time that Jesus was on the earth, you had the Roman government, which was very tyrannical and very forceful and would then cause things to take place, whether you had free will or not, they stripped you of your free will and, 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 and they ruled like a dictatorship, right? So you had to do what they said to do and they lorded over you and they could care less at all about your free will, they just used force. Well, how many of you know God came for the purpose of stripping all of that out of the earth? Like his goal in the church is that we are beginning to teach people about gentle force and that, and that one day the earth stops with all the dictatorship stuff and it starts to actually give people their free will again. I mean, think about it this way. God created us with free will and God himself will not violate our free will. Now, God is God. If there's anyone who could violate our free will, it would be him. Agreed? I mean, he's the creator. He's the maker of heaven and earth. And yet, he won't violate free will. And we get mad at that. Matter of fact, we blame him for all kinds of stuff that's not him. It's free will. But you're God and you could have stopped it. No, he's not going to violate somebody's choice. So, so somebody chose to do that to you. And what God says is just come to me because I can fix anything anybody does to you. Okay, I can make every wrong right. So, so don't, you, don't worry about all that. Don't get caught up in all that. Come to me because I'm greater than what anyone can do. And I'm greater than anybody else's choice. Matter of fact, my will and my choices, come on, man. They just, <laughs> you know, if God's going to get his will accomplished, you know what I'm saying? So, and, so, and so it's amazing because there's this balance that has to happen here. We don't want God to make us a robot where we have to do what he tells us to do without our consent. How many want to just like God sit there and zap you and you just have to worship for the next 24 hours and even though you don't want to? No hands, no takers on that? No, no nobody wants a God like that because that's a dictatorship God. That's a God that doesn't care how you feel, doesn't want your choice, just wants you to obey. And if God just wanted your obedience, can I tell you something? He could snap his fingers and you would do it. And yet he won't violate your free will because, because he will never be a dictator to get you to listen. What he does is gentle force. And the best way that you can see this gentle force is through prayer. Prayer. Which is the reason why God tells us to even pray for our enemies. Release some gentle force on your enemies. 
See, prayer is a gentle force. Prayer will never violate a person's free will, but what prayer will do is it will release heaven to begin to move on your behalf. It will cause things to align so that people begin to meet people and, and all of a sudden things start speaking into their life and start to reveal truth to them and the Spirit of God starts to open up their eyes with their understanding and starts to flood them with light and, and, and all of a sudden this revelation hits them and now they're making the right choice but not because they were forced into it by a dictator because the eyes of their understanding were opened and they began to see it the way God saw it and so now they're making the decisions God would want them to make. See, that's gentle force. Can you see that? Now, so, so the opposite of gentleness, go ahead and throw up the next slide, the opposite is tyranny. Forcing your will on someone instead of persuading their heart. And God is loving and patient, which means that he keeps, he keeps bearing with us until he can finally persuade our heart. This isn't good for you. Come on, son. Come on, daughter. You've done it a hundred times. It's never worked. Will you give it up yet? Let me show you a different way. Let me show you a way that it will work. And God is so loving and he's so gentle and he's so patient with us that he'll let us do it. Matter of fact, 70 times 7, man. He'll just keep letting us do it and keep letting us do it. And keep letting... He won't violate our free will. And yet he will always send people into our lives. Somebody will be speaking the truth to us. He will always be ministering to our heart. We open up, the, we turn on the radio. Something's saying exactly what we need to hear. We put on the TV and all of a sudden the same message is hitting us from this side and that side. He just keeps using this gentle force to try to get it to us until our eyes finally pop open and we say, you know what? I'm going to use my free will in a way that matters. <laughs> like, I I've been doing some stooly stuff and, and I need to make a different choice. And now we're doing it because God applied gentle force for the purpose of opening up our eyes because he didn't want to leave us in the hellish condition that we were in when he found us. He wants to keep setting us free. He wants to keep giving us a better, more abundant life. And the way he does that is through opening up our eyes so we start to make better choices. Amen? Amen? Now, what does man want to do? I don't want to be patient enough to persuade your heart, so I just want to force my will on you. Come on, man. We saw that during COVID, didn't we? A lot of just forcing the will of one person upon every person. And who liked that? Did anybody, was that like a wonderful thing to see? Just forcing of... Doesn't matter what you want, doesn't matter what you feel, doesn't matter what you believe. I'm not interested in persuading your heart. I'm just interested in shoving down my agenda down your throat. I mean, no, that's exactly what God's trying to pull, away, pull us away from. Matter of fact, that's why we need people that are in positions of power in government that are Christian people that know that they have to answer to a God and that have morals that say, I'm not going to violate people's free will to get there. And that's actually what our founding fathers did, by the way, is they tried to establish it in a way like, there's a reason why a president can only serve two, 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 two terms and then they can't serve again. Because they never wanted someone to become a, a king like they had come out of that would dictate everything for, 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 for the masses. There's a reason why on school boards you can only serve so many terms and then you have to sit out for a certain amount of time because the, the founding fathers, they all put this stuff in in a way where, where people were supposed to come not to be served but they were supposed to be public servants. They were supposed to come to serve. And somehow we've reversed all of this. We need to get it back. How many know the church has been guilty of it too? Come on, man. I've, I, I've been in churches where like you can't wear certain things. Bible didn't even say nothing about exactly that, but they made their own rules. And they forced that right down everybody else's throat. I knew a pastor that you had to go to him if you wanted to buy a house and get his permission. That's crazy. You had to go to him and get his blessing before you could get married. I'm just saying, like, We're not supposed to be ones that are having our thumb on everything everyone else does where we're lording over other people. That's why in this church, can I tell you something? I have, I have stripped from my job description what this world has tried to place on a pastor. It is not my job to make you obey God. It's not. 
It is my job to tell you the truth. It is my job to love you and to constantly be a gentle force in your life for the truth. It is my job to live out the truth before you so you can see what it looks like lived out. And it is up to you whether or not you do anything with that. And one day you will stand before God and you will give an account for your life. And I will stand before God and I will give an account for my life. It is not my job to make you right. It is my job to be an example before you and to teach you the truth in love. And then it is up to you on what you do with that information. And I give you the freedom to do it, and I will love on you until you finally do it. Amen. Amen. But what I won't be is I'm not going to be someone who applies external force to lord over you. I won't do that. Amen. We're not forcing our will on people. We need to persuade their heart. And I think that's been the problem with the church, is we try to force what we want on people without telling them the reason why. And we haven't been really good at selling righteousness because we don't tell people all the benefits of righteousness. Matter of fact, for most church members, for most Christians, they think sin is all the fun stuff we can't do now that we're saved. And righteousness is all the boring stuff we have to do because we're Christians. And if that's your idea, you are messed up in the head, number one. Amen? But if that's like your idea, then, then see, you're always going to struggle with sin. And you're always going to struggle in the choices that you're making because you have a completely altered viewpoint. It's completely skewed. Sin is all the stuff that steals from you, that kills you, that destroys you, that messes up your life. Sin is, is, is it's the carrot that's, that Satan puts out in front of you that says, if you can just get this carrot, everything will be great. But every time you reach out to go get it, it moves further. You never, ever will ever get what you truly desire in sin. It will never happen. The pleasure of sin will be for a short season. In the very beginning, it seems like it's going to work, but then it keeps from you the very thing you actually wanted it will never ever ever deliver on its promises if you sin to get rich you will be filled with fear that it's all going to disappear at any given moment you will never enjoy the riches that you get I'm just telling you, sin never delivers on what it promises. It never gives you the fulfillment of your heart's desire, and it never will. And instead, all it does is it creates a wake of hurt and pain in the lives of everyone around you. And righteousness is the way that, is, that, that leads to life. It's the path that we take where, you know what? We're not hurting anyone around us. And it takes longer. Yes, righteousness takes longer, all right? Sin is like a McDonald hamburger, okay? R righteousness is a, is a nice, juicy, well-cooked steak. You know what I'm saying? Like, it takes longer to make, but it's satisfying, In the end, it gives you what it promises you. Oh, are you hearing me, church? That's why we don't take the shortcut. That's why we go the long road. It's why we do the extra mile. Why? Because in the end, then we have what our heart was actually desiring. And Satan is always trying to get us to do the sinful shortcut. And the sinful shortcut will never, ever, ever work. It's true whether you like it or not, amen? And, and, and here's the deal. The sinful shortcuts are the things stealing from you, killing you, and destroying you, and messing up all your relationships and destroying your life. It, uh, matter of fact, sin is what brought hell into this earth. It was heaven until sin entered it. And can I tell you what? Sinful choices are what bring hell into our life. Our life could be heaven if we didn't make them. And so, and, so, and so God says, listen, I'm said before you, life and death, blessing and cursing, choose life. Like, hey, get a hint here. Uh, I got this better way, and use that way, because that way will work. And this other way doesn't. Amen. So we need to be able to take the time to persuade people's hearts about what is right. And why? Why don't I smoke? Why shouldn't I drink? I mean, oh, there's a bunch of reasons for this. 
I mean, there's scientific studies now that you can pull out and say, yeah, also, uh, yeah, this is why. <laughs> like, it destroys your life. It messes your life up. It's not a mystery, everyone. Sin equals stupid. <laughs> Righteousness equals wisdom. Yeah. And the reason why God tells us not to do certain things is because he won't love us. He already loved us when we, were, when we were dead in sins. It's not because he won't move for us or do something for us. He did something for us when we didn't even want to get right. He died on the cross when we didn't even want that. So what is it about? It has nothing to do with your relationship with God. Us making the right choices has to do with heaven invading our lives. And the more right choices we make, the more of a foretaste of heaven we experience while we're here on earth, the better our life becomes. The better the choices we make, the better our life becomes. Amen? So, praise the Lord. Here goes an example. Your child pulls somebody who's handicapped. You should, one, beat them, scream, and yell. I can't believe you did it. This is the tyrant. Now, am I saying we never beat our child or there's never a time to discipline our child? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I mean, in the Proverbs, we can find that, that the rod will drive foolishness out of the heart of the child. But you have, to real, you have to realize why we're doing what we're doing. See, there's a purpose behind it, and the purpose isn't to be tyrannical. The purpose isn't for that. Pur we're not beating them because, because they embarrassed us. So I'm going to beat you because you, you, you made me embarrassed. So what? Get over yourself, man. That's pretty prideful. You're going to beat him. You're going to beat your kid instead of training him because you got embarrassed. Grow up. No, 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 no. The reason is because the only time I've ever beat my child, and when I say beat, I don't mean like on the face or anything like that. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying you know, right? Uh, God gave him a little extra cushion right here for a reason. Amen. And, and, and very, very few times I've ever had to do it. Very few times I've ever had to do it. And the only time I ever did it was because I needed them to connect that action with pain. Because, because if they didn't connect it with pain, it's going to create a lot more pain down the road. Does this make sense? It wasn't because you embarrassed me. It wasn't because, no. I'm a big boy. I can, I can figure that out. But if you're doing something that is going to kill you or really, really, really destroy you, and you don't even see that that action is going to cause that pain, then I need you, I need you to connect the dots. This is going to hurt you. It's going to really mess your life up in the long run, Okay. Here goes the second one, praise the Lord, and I see, I, I see parents do this all the time. Tell, just tell a handicap joke. Just make light of it, man. <laughs> Act like it didn't even happen. Just, you know, ha -ha, laugh it all off. All right. Nobody, nobody thought that was cool here, but you've seen people do it. All right, here's number three. Help them develop a heart for the disabled. Which one should we be doing here? If we're going to be gentle... Gentle is a, it's a gentle force. It's not saying it's all good. We're going to make the changes, but we're going to do it in a, in a way that's not violating someone to a place where we're totally disregarding free will. Then what that means is, is I'm going to, I'm going to focus more on the heart than I am anywhere else. And, and, see, and see, what you got to realize is even, even as a child, and see, there, there becomes an age where you, where, where you can't do this no more to your kid because they'll turn around and beat you up. <laughs> like, there's, there becomes an age where you can't do that no more. And if that's all you're relying on, then you realize you're failing the mission. Are you listening to what I'm saying? If we're not putting in them the heart that they need, then we're not applying the right force. And, and, and what happens with that is this. If I'm putting in physical force to stop something, I will only stop it as long as physical force is applied. And the second that that physical force is no longer applied, if I didn't change their heart, they're going to go straight back to doing what they were doing before. If I figure out ways of how to help them develop a heart to make the right choice, then I've won the battle. 
And the reason I've won the battle is because it doesn't matter if I'm there or not there. They now think this thing is stupid and they're not going to do it anymore because their heart was changed. That's the battle the church is supposed to be engaging in. When I was growing up, man, they said, listen, you can't watch R-rated movies. I'm like, show me a scripture. If you watch, when I went to Bible college, they said, if you watch an R-rated movie, you will lose your anointing. <laughs> Once again, show me a scripture. I'm not necessarily for R-rated movies. I'm just saying then all of a sudden the passion of the Christ came out. And uh, Jesus gets beat pretty bad. Guess what's rated? R. Am I going to lose my anointing now if I watch the passion for the Christ? See, we make up our own rules and we try to force them down everybody's neck instead of teaching them what they need to know. Here's the truth of the matter. You can lose your, you could lose, you could lose your anointing. You can mess your life up watching a PG movie. Because it's really not what is rated. It's what's it doing to your heart. Is, is what's happening in that movie, is it affecting your heart in a way that brings you towards God and to make better choices? Or is it in doing something to your heart that's moving you away from God and, and causing you to desire something that would be a sinful choice that would be a bad thing? And, and that's what you need to know because you could watch a PG movie and it'd be doing something to your heart where it's misleading you and it's tempting you to do something that you want. And you say, you know what? I'm going to shut this off. I'm not watching this. This isn't good for me. And what's crazy about that is somebody else that's sitting right next to you could watch that movie and not experience the same temptation you're experiencing. But then all of a sudden, they watch a movie you're cool with. It doesn't bother you at all. And yet there's something in that movie that triggers something in their past, and all of a sudden they're dealing with stuff that you didn't, ever, that you didn't deal with from watching that movie. See, what's the goal of watching what we watch? It's to... It's to be sensitive to what's happening in our hearts. And we want to put a one-size-fits-all stuff in, and we want to jam it down everybody's throat and be a dictator to what everyone can do or can't do instead of teaching them the principles that they need so that they can make the best decisions for them. Do you see what I'm saying? And they give people the freedom that as long as they're not sinning, I don't need to be your Holy Ghost. But I do need you to get this, that if it's messing with your heart, you need to shut that thing off. You just broke up with somebody. Stop listening to all that sad music. Quit that. You ain't getting over nothing. It's keeping you in contact with that forever. You're crying yourself to sleep for the next month. That stuff is messing your heart up right now. That music was wonderful at another time in your life, and it'll be wonderful to listen to it at another time, but it ain't good for this time. So you know what we're doing for this season? Uh-uh. I ain't listening to that, putting on some, putting on some worship music instead. I, I, why? This stuff's messing with me too much. I can't, I can't stay engaged in this. See, gentle force has to do with us beginning to help each other realize what is happening in our heart and then help us make the right appropriate decisions and choices based on, based on the heart. And I feel like very often, instead of us focusing what Jesus focused on, which is the heart, we focus on the actions. And we demonize people over actions instead of trying to come in and help them with their heart. It's easier, it's easier to punish a child than it is to figure out creative ways of helping develop the right heart in them. And so, and so we end up being lazy, honestly. If I'm, you know, I'm trying not to step on anybody's, but some, sometimes we're lazy. Pastor David is guilty of being a lazy dad sometimes, okay? And so is everybody else. Life gets busy, and instead of looking at it and saying, what does my son or what does my daughter really need? Life takes over, and we throw a pad at them. Or a tablet or a phone or whatever it might be, because life has gotten a little bit busy. And we've got to be able to learn how to slow down enough to say, wait a minute, my job as their parent is, is their heart. It's not even their actions. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to mess up. But my job is their heart. What God wants to do with us is the same. He's the good father. What he's trying to do in us is not control us. He's trying to help us make the right decisions by changing our hearts. And one of the best things that you can do, you know, somebody's getting, they bullying a handicapped child. How about this? How about take them to a special Olympics? 
so that they get to rub shoulders with other handicapped people and disabled people. And before you know it, they're there cheering them on because, because they're, they're doing the Olympics. And, oh, now, and now he's got to win. Come on, you got to win. You got to win. And all of a sudden, they're cheering for the one that they had now made fun of, right? And if they have the heart, if they have a heart because they've rubbed shoulders with them, now they have a heart for them, guess what happens? When they go to school, they don't bully them. They stick up for them. And they don't do it because you told them to. They did it because you helped them get the right heart for that person. Amen? All right, let's go ahead and jump into this. Praise the Lord. What did you do? You did gentleness. Gentleness. It was still force. It was gentle force because you didn't violate their free will. You worked within the bounds of their free will just like God works in the bounds of our free will to help us make the right choices. Matthew says this, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them. And the great men hold them in subjection, tyrannizing over them. And and that's exactly what God's trying to get us away from, right? Is being tyrannical. Not so shall it be among you. That's not how you're supposed to do it. But whoever wishes to be great among you, you can't be the dictator. You've got to become the servant. Because the servant has the greatest potential to change someone's heart. Amen. So Esther is probably one of the best examples of this that I can find in our Bible. Esther could not be a dictator because she was a woman and the king was the dictator. (laughs) He had all the power and whatever he said went. And he was able to lead by force. I mean, he could sit there and say, y'all dead and y'all getting hung up. You know what I'm saying? Like he, he had the ability to do all of that. If he said, you can't come into this presence, you can't come into this room, you could not come into the room. Didn't matter what you wanted. Your free will made no difference. Didn't care about your free will. What he said is what happens. And if not, you were put to death. How are you going to rule someone that rules like that? And here Esther is called by God to deliver her nation, the nation of Israel. Because there was a plot that was going on that would have caused their demise. And so Esther, she had to use gentle force. She had to use gentleness. And Esther led by influencing the heart of the king. And how did she influence the king's heart? She went in and she served him. And in serving him, he developed a heart for her. And in serving, she was able then to speak into his life. How many know that's what God's calling us to? Gentle force. We serve one another. We get into each other's lives. We develop a heart for each other. We know that we care about each other. And so we're able to speak into each other's lives. Amen? 1 Peter 5 says, feed the flock of God. Notice what God wants. He wants you to care for it willingly. Why? Because he doesn't want to violate your free will. So if you don't want to feed my flock, then don't. Because if you're going to do it, this is how you need to do it. You need to do it of your own free will. Not grudgingly, where you feel like you're forced pretty amazing. Not for what you'll get out of it, but because you're eager to serve the Lord. God wants us to be willing people, and we we, we serve Him out of a willingness, out of a willing heart. We use our free will, and we choose to serve the Lord. We're not forced to serve the Lord. Don't be tyrants. (laughs) How many know a tyrant is a leader that leads by force? He didn't say don't be a leader because next he says, I want you to lead. Wow, wait a minute. So I'm called to leadership, 
I just can't lead the way the world leads. I got to be different than the way the world leads. I got to lead differently. So I'm to be a leader. I'm just not to be a tyrant. I'm to lead by my good example. And so I need to be a willing servant that leads by example. That's what God's calling us to. That's what gentleness is. We are willing servants. We lead by example. My experience with Christianity, for a large degree, has not been this. It has been tapping the other person on the shoulder, pointing the other finger at everyone else. I can't tell you how many great messages I preached that I knew the people in the audience, and I knew exactly what that word was for. And instead of the person taking the word, they tapped their spouse like, you really needed that. And I'm thinking, dude, you totally missed it. Because God was trying to speak that to you. <laughs> I know pastors where it seems like if they can get other people to obey, then it's like they right their wrong of disobedience. And so ministry becomes this really crooked, weird, twisted thing because it's not about me leading by example. It's about me trying to make penance for my sin by forcing you into obedience. And here's the reality of it is I can't make penance for my mistakes by forcing something on someone else. It's not my job to use force at all. My job is to willingly serve and to lead by example. i got to apply the Bible to myself. And in so doing it, I'm showing you a new way to live. And then you get to see the fruit of my life, and you begin to make different choices to say, wait a minute, the fruit of my life don't look like the fruit of your life, and I really would rather have your fruit than my fruit. And you start realizing, oh, wow, if I make the same decisions that you're making, if I make some of the same choices. See, you're showing a different path. You're, you're leading in a way that there's gentle force. It's not that you're not influencing people. You are influencing them, but you're not forcing it on them, you're showing it to them. And because you're showing it to them, you're opening up the eyes of their understanding. And since the eyes of their understanding are being opened, they make different choices. The church would be so much further, so much faster if we stopped pointing the finger at our neighbor and went ahead and just pointed at ourselves and said, I don't know about anybody else, but I am going to follow Jesus. As for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Whether anybody else makes any changes or not, that's, that's on them. They got to stand before God. This is on me. I'm going to serve God with all my heart. Amen. All right. So, praise the Lord. We don't lead by force. We lead by example. We are not tyrants. We are servants. I've seen husbands. I'm the head of this house, and what I say, the Bible says. All right, tyrant. The Bible says a lot of things, like, be gentle. <laughs> is it okay for me as a husband to violate the free will of my wife? No, it's not okay. Because I am to love her as Christ loves the church. And Jesus doesn't violate my free will. So I'm not supposed to be violating hers. Well, I don't care what you think. I said we're going to do this now. Well, you need to care. Because Jesus does. Amen. We need to be gentle force in their life. Which means that we're willing to bear with them until they get it. And that's not always that easy, but it is what we're called to do. It's easier to put our foot down, but can I tell you what? It only lasts while you're putting your foot down, and the second that your foot ain't down no more, guess what? No lasting permanent change. So gentleness produces lasting change, and it's the only, th it's the only way to produce it. And that's why God is in for the long haul. He makes everything beautiful in its time, but it takes time to make everything beautiful. 
And why does it take time? Because God's not forcing his will down everyone else's throat. He's leading by example. He led by example so much, and he demonstrated this so much that God came into a human body so that he could lead by example, and he came to serve us. And then he gave up his own life to serve us, to show us an example of how we should be with each other. That is called gentle force. He could have snapped his fingers, violated all of our free will, and got us all right in one moment. But he said, then I have a bunch of zombie robots and I will be a dictator and I refuse to be that. I gave them free will and I want them to have free will and I will operate within their free will and I will never violate their free will. And yet, even though they make choices that hurt each other, I'm greater than the choices that they have that hurt each other. And I can bring healing and I can bring hope and I can bring help no matter what. Amen. Amen. Second Peter says, be very diligent, adding moral excellence to your faith. Amen? So we're going to move from gentleness. How many got a good idea what gentleness is? Amen? Some gentle force. Not, not violating people's free will here. We're going to work with them. Amen? We're going to be a constant in their life. We're going to pray with them. We're going to pray that the eyes of their understanding open up. We're going to speak truth into them. We're going to speak it in love. We're not going to just accept and drop all our morals. No. The morals are still going to be there, but we're going to be loving and we're going to be patient while we try to open up the eyes of their understanding so they can see what they need to see to make the better choice. Because once they see it, they'll make it forever. Now, with that, we need to have self-control, right? So be very diligent. Add to your faith this moral excellence. And to moral excellence, add knowledge. To, uh, to knowledge, add self-control. I just love that because most people are like, well, you know, I, I got faith, man. Like faith is the goal. But faith isn't the goal. Faith is the starting place. You hear a message about Jesus and you believed in that message and that, and that faith allowed the Holy Spirit to move into your heart. That was the beginning place. Now that you got faith, it doesn't stop there. We've got to add things to the faith we've got. And the very first thing we're told to add to our faith is morality. Get your morals aligned with God's. Now that you have faith, now that you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, now that you believe that, first thing you've got to do is realize only God is good. Only God is holy. And so if you're going to be a follower of him, then you have to adapt his morality. Not your own. Can't make it up along the way. Only God is good. Therefore, only God can show me what is good. Add to it knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, add brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, add love. Amen. And basically, and praise the Lord, we pretty much hit just about all of that in just the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. So it goes on to say, if you have these qualities, and if they are constantly increasing in your life, how many know God wants them to constantly increase? You will neither be an active nor without success. If you have these qualities, so you got faith. You can have faith, but if you don't have these qualities, you can be someone with faith, but you are inactive. You can be somebody that has faith and not have any success. Well, I'm believing and I'm trusting God and I just don't get up and pray and blah, 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 and why ain't God? Oh, you're not, having, you're not having success, you're saying. Oh, it's God's fault. Or maybe it's that you haven't added to your faith the necessary qualities that he's asked you to add. Why has that always got to be God's fault? Why can't it be, you know what? I have faith, but I am not morally excellent. I've been making a bunch of horrible decisions. And so you know what? Maybe it's my decisions that are still doing this. And maybe it's not the Father. But come on, man, it's always somebody else's fault. If it's not God, it's the devil. The devil made me do it. 
that's Satan, man. He just keep messing my life up. Maybe it's not Satan messing your life up. <laughs> Maybe it's your morals. Ouch. It's my parents. My parents didn't give me what I needed. <laughs> Maybe they didn't give you what you needed. That has nothing to do with the fact that you have now come into Christ Jesus and that you are supposed to be allowing Jesus to change you from the inside. And the way we do that is not just, I have faith, I'm going to heaven, I got my ticket. It's no, 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 no. I've got faith, I believe that God is who he says he is, and therefore I'm going to follow him. And in following him, that means that I'm going to start to add to my faith moral excellence. I'm going to add to my faith knowledge about him, and I'm going to add to my faith self-control. I'm going to add to my faith brotherly kindness. I'm adding to my faith the love of God, because if I got these qualities in me and they keep on increasing, then I'm going to not be inactive, and I'm going to be really, really successful. And so the more I add these things to my life, the more success I experience in every area. My marriage successful, my children successful, my job successful, all the areas of my life I care about, God is bringing me into success if I will add the right qualities to my life. And I'm telling you, with the right qualities, man, your boss going to be looking at it saying, uh, yeah, he's the one getting the raise. <laughs> well, I can always count on him. He's always a person of his word. He's always happy, always joyful, never griping about nothing, always, always faith-filled, always. That means a lot. Amen. So self-control is possessing the inward dominion over self. The opposite of being self-controlled, maybe this will help you understand it a little bit better, is, is being self-willed, which means you're using your will for yourself, or self-pleasing. Amen? So let's take a look at that in Titus, praise the Lord, Titus chapter 1, verse 7, it says, For the overseer, as God's steward, must be blameless, not self-willed, not self-absorbed is another translation. Another translation says, over fond of having his own way, not self-willed, not self-absorbed, not overly fond of having his own way. So, so let me give you a, actually a couple more translations of that. Other translations say, not proud, not arrogant, not selfish, not bossy. <laughs> Anybody called you selfish recently? How about, how about arrogant or proud or bossy? <laughs> You're really, really bossy. <laughs> Why are you so bossy? Because you went your own way. And so you're not really caring about the free will of the other people around you because it only matters what you want, not what everybody else wants. And so you could say it this way, praise the Lord. Self-willed is having my will set on pleasing myself. Where self-control is having my will set on pleasing God. Very different. Self-control, then, is simply having myself in check. I'm not running around being selfish, thinking only about myself. I'm not using my free will to serve me. I'm using my free will to serve the Lord. Amen? Praise the Lord. Here goes the last verse that we'll look at, and it's in Acts chapter 24, 25, and I just love, I love this. Paul is actually talking to uh, Roman officials, and so these are Gentiles, Gentile leaders, actually, and he's ex explaining the gospel to them, and the Bible says that Paul expounds on three things to these Gentile rulers. Uh, the first one is righteousness, that Jesus Christ came for the purpose of giving you the gift of righteousness so that the Holy Spirit can move into your heart and then the second thing that he says is like, now that you have this gift of righteousness and, and the Spirit of God moves into your heart, the very next step is self-control, that you stop living for self and you start living for God. And then it's very interesting, the third thing that he begins to explain to these Gentiles is that, the, is that there's a coming judgment. So, so Jesus has given you righteousness and he's given you the gift of the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit can produce the fruit in your life. And that fruit is going to lead you into self-control where it's not all about you. It's about the people around you. You don't live for yourself. You're living for others. And the reason that becomes so important is because there is a day that you will stand before God and you will give an account for your life. I don't know that we speak about that enough in church anymore. That last give an account for your life thing seems to like it's just not popular today. But it's still in the Bible. 
And then, and this was the gospel that Paul was preaching to Gentile rulers, to, to, to Roman officials. And he includes these three items. Jesus came to make you righteous. And once his spirit moves into your heart, he does that for the purpose of producing fruit. But you are letting him do that. That's on you. Are you going to listen? Are you going to let him begin to do the work in you that only he wants to do? Because, because the purpose of this is so that you stop being so selfish and so that you begin to, to take other people's will into account. So that you become a gentle force in their life. And it's not just about you. It's about the people around you. Because if we do it right, then we can have boldness and confidence on the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. We've let, we've let the Spirit of God imprint the likeness of Christ into our heart and we stand before God with confidence and boldness, excited to see him. Or we will be Christians that are like like some of the Old Testament prophets. God shows up and he appears and they, and they see him and they fall to their knees and they weep and they cry and they say, I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. You're too holy, you're too righteous, you're too amazing, you're too beautiful, you're too... I don't fit in here. God's got to come in and he's got to wipe the tears from your eyes and he's got to begin to reveal to you who you really are because you never let him show you who you really are this side of heaven. And I don't know about you, I don't want to be the one falling to my knees crying and looking at all my stuff and all my mistakes and all my mess ups and how broken I am and stand before a holy God in that broken condition when God gave me his spirit for the purpose of beginning to draw me and reproduce himself in me so I could stand before him with great confidence and boldness in my life. I'd much rather allow him work this side of heaven and prepare me for the day I get to see him so that when I get to see him, I just run right into the arms of my father and I wrap up in his embrace. And I hope that's your heart too. Amen. With every head bowed, eye closed, praise the Lord. Let's just pray this prayer together. Say, say, Jesus, I believe in you. And I thank you for the gift of righteousness that you have made me right with the father. Lord, I want you to reproduce yourself in me. I don't want to be one that lives for myself. I want to be one that lives for you. Help me develop the fruit of the Spirit in my life. Help me to become more and more like you. I want to have boldness on the day I see you face to face. So here's my life. It's yours. I won't be a Christian in name only. I will be a follower of you. In Jesus' name, amen.